Hello, welcome to another episode of The Rest is Politics with me, Alistair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. And Rory, we've got a lot to get through. We've got the Tory leadership debate where I was absolutely loving your Twitter feed because I wasn't able to watch it, thank God, but I did watch it later. Uh, We also got a lot of feedback last week from our interview with Keir Starmer. So both the main parties, we're going to have to talk about them. I know you want to talk about famine. I want to talk about Mario Draghi. Uh, But also, I think we should probably start by reflecting on the life and times of David Trimble. Mm. Um, I've actually been felt a bit guilty today because I've been really, really busy. I've had loads of bids to talk about David Trimble, and I've not really had time to do much. But I do think that David Trimble was a very difficult, very challenging, very mercurial sort of character. But the historical fact is that without him, I don't think the Northern Ireland peace process would have worked and we wouldn't have got the Good Friday Agreement. So, Alistair, so just tell us a little bit about the mercurial, because obviously there have been this, all, all the testimonies that everybody's seen in public have been giant of a man, Nobel Peace Prize, but nobody's talked at all about the other side of his personality. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I think he was, I I do think that he was genuinely motivated by his political beliefs, his principles, his community, the unionist community that he was so proud of. But he, he was in a very, very difficult position all the time. I remember John Holmes, who was Tony Blair's main foreign policy advisor and the main point man on Northern Ireland when we first took office in 1997, I remember John saying, the thing you've got to remember about Trimble is he brings his enemies to the meeting with him. <laughs> uh, he was surrounded by people who were, they would literally sit there and Tony and Trimble would be in discussions and they would start to sort of, you know, they would say, oh, David, I'm not so sure about David. Are you quite sure you should have said that? And it was, it, it could be very, very difficult. And he had a very, re- his face reflected his emotions. His face would change color. He could sometimes get very, very angry. He sometimes disappeared. He was a huge opera fan. And I can remember once, <laughs> one of the really difficult moments when, you know, Tony was like, you know, get Trimble on the phone. And we found out he was in Australia watching an opera. <laughs> but and he also had a very difficult relationship with Mo Molum. Uh, Mo was a wonderful woman in lots of different ways, but I think it's fair to say she was sometimes not terribly sensitive to unionist sensibilities. And she would, I remember saying in my diaries, you know, sometimes she would just belch in the middle of a meeting, which, you know, wow. I think, the, oh, yes, you'd belch, you'd take her wig off sometimes. There's a there's a picture in my diary of me wearing her wig after she sort of slapped it on my head. This was when she was getting treated for cancer. And I think David found this quite difficult at times. And the other thing about all of the main players in the peace process, David amongst them, they enjoyed the fact that they had this direct access to Tony Blair. And sometimes that could really get up Mo's nose. Because, and I remember once we were in a meeting, I think in David Trimble's house, actually, on his farm, and we were sitting there talking. And David was like, every time David spoke, he would whisper, because he just wanted Tony Blair to hear. He was sort of Cutting out Mo. Just to sort of think that through a little bit. So the frustration from Mo Molan's point of view is that she was hoping to be central to the negotiation, but they sort of had, as it were, the equivalent of Tony Blair's direct mobile number, although maybe in those days he didn't, didn't give out his mobile number. But he did, Well, Tony, Tony, actually, interesting fact here, Rory, Tony Blair never had a mobile while he was prime minister. And uh, there are, as you will know, there are very sound security reasons for that. Uh, which Boris Johnson, with all his Russian connections, should have maybe made it, maybe paid heed to. No, I think it was more that Mo, she was the Secretary for Northern Ireland. She was a she was a key figure, but the truth is that when push came to shove, as we led up to the Good Friday Agreement, it was being driven by Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern, with Bill Clinton and George Mitchell kind of you know there or thereabouts whenever whenever needed. And, and Alistair, can you can you remind us just what from? Trimble's point of view, what the big concessions that he was struggling to make were? What what were the things that were the real sticking points for the unionist community in those days? The really difficult one was allowing Sinn Féin into the process when they hadn't really fully committed to peaceful means. And then later down the track, it was about, you know, decommissioning became an absolute nightmare to deal with. And and, and so did prisoner release. it, It depended. I mean, at one point, This has just popped into my head while we're talking. Right at the end of the whole process, when we honestly thought we were home and dry, David Trimble came in and had a absolute go at Tony Blair over this um, Ulster language, Ullens, 
And this this suddenly became – we were like, where the hell has this come from? Suddenly, we've sort of sorted prisoners, we've sorted decommissioning. And and, and tell us a little bit about the Ulster language. The Ulster language is a, is a dialect of English, is it? Yeah, but well, – well, oh, God, that was part of the discussion, Rory, is about what, how you actually define these languages. And I made the terrible mistake of saying, well, can't we just sort of wrap it all up together in kind of Celtic, non-English language? Ah, but this is where you're wrong. This is where you don't have the understanding of the situation, blah, blah, blah. Be- because because it wasn't a Celtic language, it, it's no, a dialect of English. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So this, this, but this became like you know, and, and it, of course, language is such a big thing for the nationalist community, uh, still is. Um, and suddenly they were wanting parity on these languages where we honestly, we this had never been part of the equation, and we were thinking, where's this coming from? But then suddenly, and I said that I, I saw a clip from Trimble last night where he said that the day the Good Friday Agreement came together was the greatest day of his life. And you can understand that because it was an incredible achievement for everybody concerned, but, but he was really central. And I feel the same about that. I feel it was one of the great, I, I said in the introduction to my diaries, it was, the, it was bar none the best day of all the days I had with Tony Blair. Probably the most extraordinary achievement of that government, wasn't it? Well, it was right up there. And it's why, you know, you and I have talked about this many, many times. It's why I get so angry at the cavalier way that this government is is dealing with it and i saw in your of your many tweets that i was enjoying while watching while you were watching the tv debate uh, on monday um i saw you saying and i felt you feel exact i felt exactly the same when i watched it back later is that they, they, they're not even talking about this then it's not even on the agenda of who it's, our next prime it's, minister is it's completely extraordinary isn't it um listen one thing that i i was struck by um was Trimble's early life and the the parallel with Edgar Graham. These were both leading Ulster Unionist politicians who were law professors mm. at Queen's University Belfast. And in 1983, Trimble was in his office as a as a, a don, as a professor, and he heard a shot. And Edgar Graham, who was his colleague, another law professor, another young Ulster Unionist politician, probably the future leader of the party, had just been shot dead outside the library. Mm. Um, an IRA gunman walked up and shot him, and nobody was ever prosecuted for it. And it's still, I think it's a good reminder of how disturbing and strange things were, how difficult it is still for people in Britain to comprehend. I mean, it's it's still difficult to quite understand why Edgar Graham was killed. I mean, you know, he was an active unionist politician, but in no way, as far as I can see, is there any suggestion he was involved in armed struggle at all? And he was a law professor shot outside his library. Well, it, you know, the, 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 the academics at a certain point were viewed as, you know, according to their views, as, as, as legitimate targets at a certain point. It's not interesting. My, my daughter, Grace, who, you know, she's grown up in this household. She know, she's been aware that I spent an awful lot of my time sort of, you know, flitting backwards and forwards between Belfast and London and Dublin and London and, as this thing went on. But when I mentioned, said last night, you know, it's really sad David Trimble's died and, and you know, I had to remind Grace who he was. And I think there is a, even within Northern Ireland, it's why I think Kenneth Branagh's film was actually really timely. I, I think that if things, people just forget. And, and that's why this, this government's wretched approach to this, people forget just how hard it was. And if you, if you, you should check it out, Roy, if you look at the clip that I'm talking about where Trimble just, he was very emotional. It was quite near the end of his life, I think. He didn't look very well. I think it was at the unveiling of a portrait of him. And he just said, you know, it was the greatest day of my life and it would never get better what's, than that. What's the, it would never get better what's, than that. What's the Kenneth Branagh film? Uh, Belfast. It's the, Kenneth Branagh made a film based on his own childhood growing up in the Troubles. Um, and uh, it's a great film. It really is. And, uh, but I, I, and, I, and I do think that sometimes with these, with these things, you, have, you just have to keep reminding people what the facts are. Sylvia Herman, who was uh, an MP mm. with me, I, I, I remember saying that she was there on the day when Edgar Graham was shot and when David Trimble was there in the university at the same time. They were all there in the university on the same day. Mm. And the thing that completely chilled her was that the student union cheered when the news came through that their professor had been executed outside the library. Mm. And she said she'd never step foot in the student union again. And it was, uh, I mean, that too just sort of brought home to me, I suppose it's something about human nature, something about the way in which these conflicts develop, this sort of lack of empathy that students could have cheered at that moment. And also a reason a reason not to get too sentimental about the young. That's another one of my obsessions, well, the idea that yeah. young people always 
are always on the right side of things. Yeah, but I think I I, I remember no, I was flicking through my because I, I actually wrote a, a book on the the peace process that was based on my diaries, which is only been published, it's only available in Ireland. Um, and Trimble's actually with Tony and Clinton and Seamus Mallon, the picture on the front cover. And I was flicking through it last night, and I can remember a meeting that Trimble was where Trimble was with McGuinness. And I can remember we we were asking them to kind of move on issues that Sinn Fein were wanting sort of a bit of progress on. And you know, I remember McGuinness saying, "Listen, you don't understand what it's like to sit down in a room with people that you know have tried to kill you." And that is the fact. And David Trimble, you know, these guys were living with the fear of a bullet in their head the whole time. And the other thing about David Trimble, you know, it's why when I look at Jeffrey Donaldson now, I mean, I remember the trouble that Jeffrey Donaldson used to give Trimble a lot of the time. He was under massive pressure. He had Ian Paisley at the gate. We had literally had Ian Paisley at the gates. And David Trimble was not a kind of, he wasn't that classic you know, fire and brimstone politician. I remember Tony actually once saying that for a politician, David had, you know, some of the worst political skills of any politician he'd ever met, but he delivered. And ultimately, you know, his family in their grief at the moment, they can take an awful lot of pride in a genuine legacy. Not many politicians have that. Am I right in saying, I may misunderstood this, that actually like many great politicians who did very brave things, he effectively destroyed his party in the process. A bit like LBJ, who took through civil rights and the US and wiped out the Democratic Party in the southern United States from then onwards. I, th I think I think he, he, he took a huge risk. It paid off in terms of getting the Good Friday Agreement and, and getting it passed in a referendum north and south. But ultimately, I think it, I think he would probably recognise that that was the beginning of of the, his demise. As a he was the first for, he was the first minister, um, but slowly the more, if you like, they would define themselves as the more radical elements of unionism um, took over. But I think at the same time, I think he would have, you know, when Ian Paisley, I actually think the the, the most extraordinary moment of them all. I remember I was I was actually no longer working in the government at the time, and I was in Dublin, and I can remember seeing a billboard, and, and it was a picture of McGuinness and and uh, Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley, and it was when they were christened the Chuckle Brothers, Chuckle Brothers Unite for Unite in Peace, and I, I I just remember looking at that and thinking, oh my God, and you know David Trimble was out by then, no longer the first minister, Ian Paisley was in, but David Trimble was a big part of that process. Well, let's thank you for that. And I thought that was really, really, really interesting. And I think there's very, I, I haven't seen much on the different sides of him. Um, and, you know, it'd be interested at some point, maybe not now, but to come back to why you think he was uh, such an enthusiastic Brexiteer. Unlike Sylvia Herman. Unlike Sylvia Herman. Who, <laughs> unlike Sylvia Herman, who I'm very fond of Sylvia Herman. She's um, great. She's terrific. Um, can, I, can I get you on to Mario Draghi, who you wanted to talk about? So just to remind listeners before we let Alistair in, Mario Draghi um, is the kind of quintessential grand technocrat of our age, president of the European Central Bank, uh, works, I think, for Goldman Sachs, or definitely one of the big banks, um, and like all these sort of titans of international finance, move very smoothly between the European Commission and making a fortune as a banker and then back to the ECB, and then apparently just as smoothly moved back to be the Prime Minister of Italy until he <laughs> has now just resigned. So tell us a bit about this. I think this is a fascinating situation and actually really quite a worrying one. And I think it's another victory for our old enemy populism. Um, essentially what happened, and if you think about it, it's only a month ago that Draghi was with Macron and Schultz and uh, and the uh, Ionis of Romania in Kiev as the big kind of European contingent sitting down with Zelensky. He'd been a massive player in getting the the economic sanctions put through because of all his connections with you know money and finance and so forth. And then suddenly this populist, rather ailing populist part of his coalition, the Five Star Movement, decide they don't support his cost of living approach. And then the right, the Liga, the far right, and Forza Italia, which essentially is Berlusconi's mob, they spot an opportunity to bring him down and they take it. And it's interesting what it made me think, you know, the reason why I think it's so interesting is that who, I think whatever government replaces him will not be as firm on Russia, Ukraine. Italy has got, uh, I think during the Cold War, Italy had the biggest communist party in Europe. There is still an extreme left and there is a very powerful extreme right. And the money, the current betting is all on this uh, Georgia Maloney woman, 
who is the leader of the Brothers of Italy, which, I mean, they de- I don't know what this means, but they get defined as post-fascist. Right. Um, now, post-fascist <laughs> It's a bit worrying be, when you put the P in well, front. It's, yeah. it, I mean, anything that, where you feel that you have to have the F word in your, yeah. in your title. And the thing is, she's sort of moved. She's become the darling of the hard right, rather supplanting Salvini, because, of course, Salvini has been damaged by being part of the coalition. So, so one of the one of the um, questions, I guess, which will be raised, and I, I I tend to believe with these guys because remember there was a guy called Mario Monti who was the great yeah. technocrat who was brought in after the financial crisis before and also didn't really manage to last. Is whether this goes back to the thing we keep talking about? Is whether yes, of course, our our sympathies are with the technocrats. They're smart. They're often pursuing what seem to be the logical right policies, but they fail. And I wonder whether. It isn't partly their fault whether actually in this case, if Draghi had been a bit more nimble politically, a little bit better a communicator, prepared to make a few compromises to his coalition, whether he wouldn't have been able to keep it together. Mm, I think that's a tough one. I mean, uh, look, I think he'd he done some pretty extraordinary things. I mean, he just, for example, on he, he just signed this new deal with Algeria. Algeria was going to take over from Russia as the main gas supplier. Um, he, he, you know, one of the, the problems with this situation now is that he'd, he'd um, established this huge COVID rescue package through the European Union, which is now at risk because they don't have a government able to pass a budget. Um, and the foreign, the foreign minister, Luigi Di Maio, he's, he's, he said um, that the, the Russians are now celebrating having made yet another Western government fall. Um, I don't think we can now, we will now be able to send any more arms to Ukraine. Now, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but that's quite a big statement to make. So this is yet another sort of populism. Remember Salvini, who yep, sure. posed in posed in Red Square with a yep. Putin T-shirt. Yep. And Salvini, of course, again for listeners who've not been keeping up that much, one of the real masters of social media guy, Absolutely. famously who had an enormous social media team and was famous uh, in Rome for every time there was an incident, he would sort of hear about it and be at the ticker tape, standing there whenever there was a crime, standing with the police. Mm. throwing out the tweets to keep it all going. Uh, his, popul- his populism, Rory, he's, he's a populist and Maloney is a populist. She's actually she's actually being slightly less pro-Putin. She's had, she's had a similar makeover to Marine Le Pen in terms of not talking about the overtly fascist stuff. Hence the post. Um, <laughs> hence, hence the post. post. Um, any, anyone listening interesting, interested in, in another side of this, Lorenzo Marcelli's written quite a good piece in The Guardian trying to talk about the failure of progressive forces in Italy. And uh, maybe we should take a little break and come back for the Tory leadership. Why not? I mean, it's such a thrill. You loved it so much, Roy. I, I, <laughs> keep, I could keep, tell. Keep the listeners tuning in. We can't be too gloomy. My favourite tweet of the night, you got something like 30,000 likes uh, for saying, for pointing out to Liz Truss, who kept banging on about her terrible upbringing in Leeds and Paisley and the terrible school she went to, you pointed out that this was entirely during the period of Margaret Thatcher in office. And there she was pretending to it's, be it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Margaret Thatcher. She kept saying to the audience, I, I went through the horrors of basically, no, didn't quite, not quite quoting, but the implication was <laughs> I went through the horrors of the 80s and 90s. I, I, I know what it's like. I understand leveling up. I was in those communities that got left behind. I experienced the economic recession. I experienced the inflation, et cetera. And you're thinking, whoa, 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 hold a sec. You're meant to be selling yourself as the heir of Margaret Thatcher. (laughs) Um, Anyway, more on that after the break. Welcome back to The Rest is Politics with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. Alistair, when you got off your flight from France and stopped presumably grumbling about Brexit's effect on how long it took you to get through the airport, you managed to have a look at this debate. What, what was your sense of it? Well, you had set me up because I'd been flicking through Twitter and you were absolutely on fire. I was very proud of Paul War, uh, well-known journalist and Twitter, Twitterer, uh, saying that I've trained you well, Rory. He felt you were really putting the boot in quite well to both of them. <laughs> <laughs> But I was I was pretty appalled by the whole thing. I mean, the staging of it was weird. The whole thing at the start where they literally looked like cardboard cutouts. And I thought they were cardboard cutouts until eventually Richie Sunak blinked. Anyone who anyone who didn't watch it, um, it was really odd. And it, a real example of why, I mean, I watch all the US debates. I've never seen anyone in the US screw it up like this. I mean, essentially it began with what looked like two cardboard cutouts of Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. And the camera 
sat for, I think, probably two seconds on these unmoving cardboard cutouts. And then suddenly, very disturbingly, the Rishi Sunak cardboard cutout stopped smiling and its lips came down. And you realize that actually they were two living human beings who'd been forced to hold these rictus grins mm. while the cameras were running and rolling. And I, I just, it, it's something, I think it's amusing for directors. They do it in documentaries because mm. they can get these sort of odd facial features. Obviously, if you're forced to hold a photograph smile for three seconds, you end up looking, mm. and maybe it was longer. I mean, it felt like a very, very, very long time. I, I, and I'm very humiliating for them, I think. Well, I'll tell you what, Roy, I, we, I've, the reason I've come back from France, having had a nightmare journey out, I have to tell you, a nightmare through Dover. But the reason I've come back is to do, we're doing the final tomorrow of the Make Me Prime Minister, tomorrow Wednesday, the Make Me Prime Minister uh, programme I've been working on. And I promise you, I guarantee you, the quality of debate will be better between these three members of the public. I promise you it will be better. Are you, are you going to begin with making them look like cardboard cutouts? No. Because the question for you, if you're in that situation, I'm often in that situation, is do you actually just step aside and call out the BBC and say, you're you making me look like a tit? What are you doing? Listen, we, all those, you, you, you have to negotiate that stuff. I mean, and the other problem, Rory, is because there's so little by way of substance being debated, we end up talking about this crap. And the other crap that we end I, I was genuinely shocked that they even raise that ridiculous nonsense from the Dean Dorries about earrings and shoes and suits. And the other thing, I mean, look, the BBC don't make it easy to keep defending them as I try to do, but how could, you can't say things like, yes, public sector strikes, yes or no. Yeah. And the other thing, the other moment yeah. for me, Rory, yeah. literally, literally 30 seconds after they had both said, you're going to get honesty for me. I'll always tell you the truth, says Rishi. I'll always be honest with you, says Liz Truss. They get a question, have the queues at Dover got anything to do with Brexit? And they race to lie. They both race. They're in a race. No, no. Let, let's, let, let's just go back to the beginning of the debate then for a second. So the really interesting thing at the beginning of the debate. Rory, did you have your tie on or off while you were watching the debate, by the way? That's the oh, yeah, yeah. I, obviously, I always watch where my tie when I'm hearing the BBC. I, I like to show respect to the news newscaster. So beginning of the debate, I, I think it was the first time we've actually had a chance in one of these debates going back probably 10 years to see a really clear economic disagreement. And it was a very, very interesting one, actually. Fundamentally, Rishi Sunak is trying to balance the books. That's his big push. And in order to do it, he's prepared to raise national insurance, raise corporation tax. And Liz Truss is making a very different argument. She's saying that that will choke off growth. She wants to lower taxes. She's not so worried about balancing the books. She wants to generate the economic growth and that she'll get the deficit and debt under control later. And it's a really interesting standoff because it goes to the heart of two contradictory conservative instincts. And conservative viewers watching it, so me thinking now as an ex-conservative MP, uh, have a real head-heart situation. In their head, they think, okay, we've got to balance the budget because that was something that right at the very heart of the way that Mrs. Thatcher communicated was her, she always described the national economy as a sort of household budget. Which is a stupid, which, which is one of the worst of her legacies because, you know, households can't print money. Households can't raise taxes. House, households can't borrow to the extent that governments can. I mean, the whole thing is a nonsense. It goes all the way back to actually the great liberal prime minister Gladstone, who I think also was very, very concerned with this idea of balancing budgets and not, mm. not going to debt. So that, that's what Rishi was selling. And he was... I saw it's channeling Mrs. Thatcher because he was actually saying when he worked in his mother's pharmacy, he had to balance the books all the time. Mm. Whereas Liz Truss is actually saying she was praising the economic approach of the United States and Canada, which in mm. case anyone has noticed, are not actually conservative governments, right? They're, they're <laughs> governments that are much more comfortable with larger deficits and larger debts. So that, that would worry the Conservatives, but she's saying she's going to cut taxes, which is the heart thing. People think, mm. oh, great, taxes are going to come down. And she's selling this story, which is increasingly popular with Conservative voters, but was never part of Margaret Thatcher or, or Nigel Lawson's orthodoxy, which is the idea that if you cut taxes, you can stimulate so much growth that you get more revenue Mm. than you were getting from the taxes in the first place. In fact, Nigel Lawson has actually made a public statement saying he never believed that. Rory, uh, this, this is a question that I'm channeling from Fiona, who she said, can you ask Rory whether a lot of these Tory party members are just a bit thick? I don't think they're particularly thick, no. But Rory, why? She's talking economically, she's talking absolute nonsense. 
And Mrs. Thatcher would have condemned it as nonsense. They're claim, as you say, they're claiming the bits of Thatcherism they want. No, very, very much not what Mrs. Thatcher wanted to do. She would have been probably closer to the Rishi Sunak side on this. She yeah. wouldn't have believed that you, at a time when inflation is taking off and your deficit and debt is ballooning, she wouldn't have seen that as the moment to be doing the kind of things that Liz Truss is talking about. But I think the way in which populists of all sorts, and, and what we're looking at is a kind of muted form of populism, the way they always get away with it is, of course, there's something in what they say which is true. So it, it is true, of course, that raising corporation tax may, in fact, stifle the economic recovery. And it's probably also true, as she says, that we can endure more deficit and more debt than Rishi Sunak thinks we can. Mm. Well, it's not a very conservative thing to say. In fact, it's more of a labor thing to say, to say you don't have to be tight in the debt, debt and deficit. But it's a an argument that will have got through to people. They're not very amused by the basic austerity message, which is you've mm. got to cut the debt and deficit and balance the books. So she will have been able to get people thinking, well, maybe Rishi was wrong to raise corporation tax and national insurance. Of course, she's right that we've got to stimulate growth. She's probably right. People will think that we don't need to cut the debt as sharply as she says. So do you think there is a single economist who was watching that debate with anything other than head in hands? I, I think they were most, most um, economists will have been much more closely on Rishi Sunak's side. And that's very clear. I mean, she, Liz Truss has tried to get economists to endorse her. The only person she's really managed to get. Patrick Minford. Is Patrick Minford, who is amazing. I mean, I, I know Patrick Minford and I took testimony from him on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. And I remember saying to him, what the hard Brexit that he was suggesting with hard borders with Europe, I said, it's going to destroy the British car industry. And he looked me in the eye and he said, yeah. Yeah, mm. well, it's about time the British car industry was destroyed because, you know, we need to get more efficient and it's not efficient for us to produce our own cars. And I tried to take this clip and show it to people and say, you know, this is the number one pro-Brexit economist here. Are you really prepared to destroy the whole Midlands, destroy our entire automobile industry? But nobody would ever take seriously what he actually says and believes. And, she, and he, he's, the, he's the one economist who appears to be endorsing, endorsing this trust. The other thing I find strange about Rishi Sunak is that I think he is actually deep down much more right wing than Liz Truss. I mean, Liz Truss is obviously, you know, former in Maine, a former Lib Dem. She just sort of goes with the wind. And the wind at the moment in the Tory party is very much with the kind of European research group. I think Sunak is very right wing. And I'll tell you one thing that I, I, I haven't heard discussed in any of the debates. There's barely any coverage of it in the media. But then now the next kind of arms race between them is about who loves these enterprise zones and charter cities the most. And, and Sunak, his, his father-in-law, of whom he's very proud and keeps saying, I think he's quite a mover in this. This whole charter cities thing, I really think people need to, it's one of the many things people need to wake up about. Because charter cities, they've been tried in Honduras and thankfully yeah, failed. T t tell us what a charter city is, basically. Well, a charter city essentially is that if I explain to you the Charter Cities Institute, these right-wing organizations, they always have wonderful neutral titles like Taxpayers Alliance. And so the Charter Cities Institute, they want what they call deep regulatory and administrative reforms. And they essentially want to be able to govern charter cities inside the jurisdiction of a sovereign state, but the charter city will be responsible for its own governance. And that is where Sunak wants to go. And that means you can have lower tax than the rest of the country, you can have different judicial system, you can have different labour market laws. And it can be, in the theory, very, very extreme. I don't think Rishi Sunak wants to go this far, but I remember when I, I was- I think in, he does. Well, when I, I was think international does. development minister, I remember seeing the chief economist of the World Bank in those days who wanted to make one of these things in Libya. And he described mm -hmm. it he wanted to tear off a corner of the Libyan coast, create this international city. He talked about making a mini Hong Kong. And essentially, it was a sort of colony he was creating. There were going to be no labor regulations. There were going to be no planning regulations, which was true, of course, in Hong Kong in the early days. New Territory had these horrible, dangerous high-rise buildings went up, very, very low wages, basically no social security, trying to create this sort of raw capitalist vision um, on an experimental basis. But listen, you talked about Patrick Minford. 
Johnson was never a sort of ideological Brexiteer. Liz Truss is not an ideological Brexiteer. Sunak was an ideological Brexiteer. And that is because I believe he is absolutely part of this, what I call this sovereign individual approach. Sovereign individual, which I, we can put in the show notes, a very, very, very long piece I wrote about this. It's a book written by Jacob rees mogs dad, William rees mogg back in 1998, which is one of the most terrifying books I've ever read because it, reading it today is him foretelling lots of the stuff that's happening now. And this whole Charter City movement is about basically getting rich people out of the control of democratic government. That's what it's about. Let me push back for a second. So the guy that dreamt it up is this chief economist of the World Bank, as I said, I know, Paul Romer. I'm not d denying he, he dreamt up Charter Cities, but they are now being used for something very, very different to what he, he envisaged. The way in which they're talking about them now is a sort of exaggerated free port, isn't it? And, and, the, and the problem with it is that instead of making the correct decisions to create a good business environment right the way across the country, you're basically creating these little pockets. So mm. my, my big argument against it is that it's going to create all kinds of distortions and inequalities. I'm not a believer in this sort of free port approach. If you're worried that there are, we've got the wrong kind of regulations or we don't have the right type of property rights or our planning is wrong, why not push it out nationally across the country, give everybody a chance to have a good enabling environment rather than trying to create a little pocket for it. Because that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. And, and, and I, I don't think, I think Sunak understands it and Liz Truss doesn't. She was sort of talking about enterprise zones with knobs on or, you know, booster rockets or something. I think it's part of this very, very right wing vision. And what's extraordinary, when you look at the people who are, that Chartered Cities Institute website that I mentioned, they, they talk about the, the purpose as they see it is to provide a fresh approach to tackle humanity's most pressing challenges, global poverty, climate change, and rapid urbanization. And then when you look at the people who are funding the damn thing, it's the usual suspects. It's Robert Mercer. It's the Koch brothers, who, you know, frankly, for whom there should be a special place in hell for their work against climate, uh, in climate denial. So these are the same people. And who are their supporters in the UK, Rory? 55 Tufton Street, the Taxpayers Alliance, the Institute of Economic Affairs. So I think that this is why it's so weird that Sunak is pretending to be to the left of trust. Another thing that, that just before we move on from this on to, the, to, to Africa. I could talk I'm, about this all day, Rory. They're very keen to do. But it's part <laughs> of another pattern within uh, right-wing parties in, across Europe of picking up on arguments from the United States and then importing, importing them across. You know, hence... You saw Oliver Dowden going off to talk about statues, pulling down statues in Washington and going out to mm. think tanks there. You, you can see this come back forth. Um, can, I, can I bring us to something that's really, I, I think we agree on strongly, but maybe hasn't been spelt out enough in the media. The Treasury has now just said that effectively all the money that was meant to be spent on overseas development has mm. been spent on Ukraine and there's no money left. And it looks as though the Chief Secretary Treasury said, stop all non-essential aid projects, whatever on earth non-essential means. And this is extraordinary because we're starting from an incredibly low base. I was in an African country recently where when I was the Secretary of State for International Development, we were spending 100 million a year. We're now spending 20 million a year. In Yemen, where we were putting 280 million a year in, we're now struggling to put in 80, despite an enormous famine, real need in, in Yemen. And now we're facing in Kenya, Somalia, and in Ethiopia, one of the worst drought conditions for 70 years. Mm. Seven million people on the edge of starvation in Somalia, probably three million on the edge of starvation now in Kenya, the, the highest level of starvation, total inability of the UN to raise any money to meet this. And Britain is cutting from that low base. So I suppose what I was leading up to is that all those figures were before this announcement. In other words, We'd already hacked really hard. And people didn't understand this because the government said, oh, they just dropped spending from 0.7% of GNI to 0.5%, which didn't sound like very much. What they didn't explain is that so much of the money was already pre-committed that they took out almost all the flexible money that was there for doing programs in individual countries. This will be, if it's followed through, basically the end of British aid in Africa. This is why watching this clown Johnson you know, playing his games, playing at being a Ukrainian soldier, playing at being a fighter jet pilot. His legacy 
is Brexit, disaster in my view. And I think, I'm, I'm amazed, Rory, you're not angrier than you are about this whole development thing, because it, the, the Britain has been one of the great countries historically on development, including, including during Tory governments, by the way. I would argue we were really good under New Labour, but I think that I would recognise, I, remember, I can remember Linda Chalker, when Linda Chalker was overseas aid minister, she was taken seriously on, in, in, around the world as somebody who really cared about aid. I think people said the same about you and Andrew Mitchell as well. And now, there's one of the questions we got, we had over a thousand questions again this week, and one of the questions was somebody who said, I haven't got it in front of me, so I can't remember his name, but he said, What's, what, what policies, if you look at Tory policies today, do you think they are closer to the Tory party of 20 years ago or the National Front and British National Party of 20 years ago? And if you think about it, we have basically said, let's stop helping the poorest people of the world. That's what we've done. And that's what you've just described, and you've described it in facts and figures, which will have a direct consequence of people dying and of us basically saying, we don't give a shit. And, and the tragedy of it is that Africa is probably in the worst position it's now been in in four decades. It's going to get much, much worse. 60% of its wheat comes out of Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. The economies are stagnating. The global recession will hit Africa worse than anywhere. And so the need has never been greater mm. and the lack of generosity from Britain has never been more striking. But also to take it back to the, the leadership debate. So there's Liz Truss. She's the foreign secretary. The development part, if you remember that DFID was, in, was, was absorbed into the foreign office, the development part has barely figured in her agenda. I don't think it's been, I don't think she's, I've not heard her asked about it once during this whole leadership thing. And that's what happens when you have a, a populist government and a pliant media that just goes along with the absolute bullshit that they talk all day long. All right. So, um, so ballots go out, fifth of August, pretty soon. Uh, yeah. An announcement, fifth September. So, I mean, it's, Rory, it's ridiculous. General elections don't last as long as this. But it's also slightly disturbing because it means that within five, five or six weeks, uh, we're going to be looking at these people coming in. And the problems that I'm worried about, like you, are what kind of promises are people going to feel forced to make over the next five, six weeks to try to win over? that right of the party. I mean, everybody is trying to pitch towards the right of the Conservative Party. And I'm, I feel this with the China rhetoric. Mm. You know, we, China is obviously our number one importer, as Faisal Islam tried to point out in that debate. He was the BBC economics ad advisor. Yeah. And there was a sort of weird Muppets show thing going on for people who didn't watch it, where these <laughs> two guys, Chris Mason and my, Faisal Islam, were sitting there like the, the, the guys in the peanut gallery in the Muppets show. You're not saying they're Muppets, are you? You're not I've calling them Muppets. <laughs> Definitely not saying no. that. I thought they were. I, th I thought they were more. Imp they, they were more impressive than the two candidates. Yeah, I have to I, say. I, I'm expecting you now to compare me to Miss Piggy. I'm trying to trying to avoid that if I can. Um, <laughs> but but the problems they are going to be confronting are unbelievable. Mm. Absolutely unbelievable. Inflation is completely out of control. Mm. Nobody has an answer really. Not not the Labour Party. Not the Conservatives on actually what we're going to do about wages, because obviously people are really hurting. Obviously, people want their wages to go up with inflation. But equally, the Treasury will be saying, if the government awards uh, pay rises in line with inflation, it's going to drive inflation even more, mm. which mm. was experienced in the 1970s, wasn't it? Here's one for you, Rory. It, it's pretty obvious watching them that they don't like each other. And it's, ob it's even more obvious watching the sort of really quite unpleasant kind of backstabbing and briefing that's going on behind the scenes. And I think it has damaged both of them. But I've, I've often wondered, because David Cameron forbade the Remain campaign for doing what he called blue on blue, I wonder actually if he had not done that. Clearly, Truss and Sunak have decided that blue on blue is fine. I think blue on blue is fine. I think people will have the fantastic opportunity next week to listen to the last in my episode on argument, but, uh, which is going to be next Tuesday morning at nine o'clock on BBC. Nine o'clock, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but in that, I'm trying to argue that Argument is really helpful. Whatever I'm troubled about in this leadership debate, it's not that they're arguing with each other. I really want them to argue with each other. Mm. I, I think it's so important. And it, it's fascinating how difficult it is, even when they do argue with each other, mm. to expose lies, really show where the dividing lines are, really leave anyone the wiser. But I, and, I, and I do think that, that part of that is the way that the media now conducts itself in relation to debate. Here are a couple of things which weren't 
said to the candidates, which maybe if you and I get the chance to quiz them, we could try. <laughs> the the invitation remains open. Come on, maybe so, do you think Sunak might do it? Liz Truss wouldn't come near it, but do you think Sunak might? Well, we could we could try. We could, could you ask him? A, we could give him a go. Ask the problem is, I'm slightly. I mean, with all my reservations, you used I'm, to sit at you used to sit in the library with him. You told yeah, with me a, that. yeah, my 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 reservation with all my reservations, I'm slightly more on his side, and I'm slightly worried that coming on our show is kind of going to be damaging for the brand. Which brand? You or him? No, him. Him. We're all going to be mean to him. We don't care about him. <laughs> care about <laughs> our Rory? We get ruthless for God's sake. Honestly. Now, listen. Here's a couple of things we want to ask him. Um, one of them, obviously, is monkeypox. Right, which is a very, very serious thing, which nobody is talking about, and where we need to bring in immediately very, very clear processes mm. on education, people going to quarantine. Mm -hmm. Here's another thing. NHS, we have a shortage, I believe, at the moment. I can't really believe it, but apparently we've got a shortage of 105,000 doctors and nurses. Yeah. And we need to recruit 475,000 clinicians and 475,000 care workers in the next decade. And that Germany has 48% more doctors per capita than we do. I'm stealing this from Polly Toynbee. But it's a pretty staggering statistics. And I don't really see how anyone can solve those problems. West Streeting's talking about training. But that is a much, much longer term mm. thing. And we're facing a short term crisis, which is beyond imagining. Well, one, of, one, of, um, one of our neighbours here is uh, Chris Hopson, who's been all over the media during the... Um, the pandemic as boss of NHS providers, but he's now, he's moved to a different role. Um, but when you talk to people who are kind of at the front end of actually NHS management, the numbers are terrifying. Uh, I hadn't heard those. I hadn't heard those numbers that you've just read out, but it fits with other stuff that I, that I've seen. And look, Rory, let's just be again, honest about this. A lot of that shortage has been caused by people who were, previously allowed and entitled and welcome to work here, those members, citizens from the European Union, who've gone back to somewhere where they're more valued and more welcomed. And I think the other thing is, is we're back to this whole populist thing. They talk about the National Health Service. Um, they talk about their commitment to it. But I'm afraid when I hear Sunak talk about it, I can't see beyond some of these meetings that he keeps flitting off to have with his libertarian friends in the United States. Well, let's, let's, let's finish back with where we began, which is David Trimble and his his push for Ullens, the, the Ulster language sort of version of Lowland Scots. And it, it brings me to an, another thing that I read in a newspaper this morning, which I thought you'd quite enjoy, which was um, a Jenny Colgan, who is just rediscovering her love of Scottish Gaelic. 1980s, 80% 80 of people in the Western, Western Isles, like, like your father, spoke Scottish Gaelic, now down to 40%. But she has a lovely point about language. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd like you to think about this. Maybe this is right. Maybe it's wrong. You know more about this stuff than me. She says that the word liath in Scottish Gaelic means both blue and grey because it's a way of describing the sky in Western Scotland. And the word gorm means blue, but it also is the colour of grass. So it seems to mean blue and green at the same time. Any, any other examples of that with us to finish on? Well, th that means, Roy, that if we were to go down the route at any point of a teal <laughs> teal approach, we, we would call it Gorham, <laughs> <Very good. We don't laughs> which is slightly better than your previous political party moniker, SLUP, the Scottish Liberal <laughs> Unionist Party. Now, listen, we haven't had time. We should do it in the Q&A, maybe. We should talk about some of the questions that we got on our interview with Keir Starmer, because there were a lot of them. And lots of other stuff. And they, uh, honestly, some of these questions, I, unlike you, because you're very, very, very busy and I'm only just partially busy, I literally do spend hours just going through these questions because they gave me so many ideas for other stuff to do and to write about. Somebody looking at it was slightly worried about your health. He saw these sort of thousands of questions laid out on bits of paper. On <laughs> he was staring. Anyway, can I, can I give, can I, can I, can we end with one of my favorite poems? Go on. I'm only, yes. only going to give you the title, not the whole poem. The reason I do that, Rory, is because of a, a wonderful poem by a lady you may have heard of called Marilyn Monroe. And she wrote a poem once called Think in Ink. Think in Ink. And that's Beautiful. what I do. Well, we'd we, we like that poem someday. Thank you very much, guys. And look forward to seeing you again on the show soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>